three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant and I'm the vice chair of the Transportation Advisory Co Committee known as the Dr. Cog TAC. I'm filling in today for TAC Chair Steve Durian and I call the February 28th, 2022 meeting to order at 1.30. Dr. Cog uses the digital platform Zoom. Please take a moment to make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. Members and alternates, you have the ability to mute, unmute yourself and share your webcam. We ask that you use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or would like to speak for an agenda item with questions and comments. If you have a technical question, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box at any time. At this time, we'll call for the roll. Cam, can you please call the roll of attendees? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in attendance for members and alternates at this time, I currently see Sarah Grant, Brian Weimer, Don Sluter, Bill Soroy, Aaron Busto, Chris Hudson, Chris Montoya, David Gaspers, David Ulane, Elizabeth Relford, Frank Bruno, Fred Rollenhagen, George Hollenkoff, Hillary Simmons, Jean Sampson, Jessica Micklebust, Kent Mormon, Kristen Kenyon, Kevin Ash, Megan Davis, Mike Whitaker, Ron Papsdorf, Tom Reif, and uh, Jessica Furka was calling in on the phone. Those are the members and alternates I see at this time, uh, Madam Chair. Wonderful, thank you, Cam. And for some reason you did not hear your name, please email cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. At this time, I'll hand it over to Jacob as we have an introduction of a few new members. Jacob Rieger. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. I do wanna welcome a couple new members today. Uh, first, Justin Smith, Schmitz, who is the Public Works Director for the City of Lone Tree, is a new member from Douglas County. He's replacing John Cotton. So Justin, welcome to our wonderful group here at the TAC. Um, also for Jefferson County for this meeting, they have a temporary alternate for today. Um, Yelena Anand, welcome Yelena to TAC as well. And then while I have the floor, I also wanted to make one announcement. We wanted to um, congratulate just, or excuse me, <laughs> we wanted to congratulate Carson Priest, um, who's the incoming new executive director of Smart Commute Metro North. Uh, we also wanna recognize uh, Karen Stewart for her service and congratulate Carson. So um, Carson, I don't wanna put you on the spot if you have anything to say, but wanted to recognize you. Great, thank you, Jacob. Carson, congratulations and welcome Justin and Yelena. Now we'll move thank on you, to- Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you. We'll move on to public comment now and we'll open uh, the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, you can raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button. We'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you can continue uh, and you can unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and you will be muted. At this time, do we have any public comment? I will allow a moment here for those to raise their virtual hands. And again, if you're on the phone, you can press star nine to unmute yourself. Seeing none at this time, we will close the public comment. And just as a reminder, uh, after public comment period, not only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. At this time, we'll move on to the January 24th, 2022 TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the January 24th, 2022 TAC meeting summary? Again, please raise your hand to indicate you have a question or correction, or if would like to speak. I'll allow a moment for folks to raise their virtual hand. Seeing no hands at this time, uh, the meeting minutes, meeting notes will stand as is. Wonderful. 
So right, uh, we'll move on to our uh, action items for the day. And our first agenda item will be the transit super call project funding for July 2022 to 20, June 2023. Attachment B and Matthew Helfont, Senior Transportation Planner, will lead us through this item. Good afternoon, uh, Matthew Helfant, Senior Transportation Planner. Get this presentation up just one moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. There we go. Okay, so um, this was the first ever call for projects for three different funding sources at the same time uh, in a coordinated fashion that we've done at Dr. Cog, uh, with three uh, with the three funding sources being the uh, HST or the Human Service Transportation Tip Set Aside, uh, fifty three ten. Uh, FDA 5310 uh, in uh, the Denver Aurora Urbanized Area, as well as Area Agency on Aging Older Americans Act funding. The projects will be implemented between July 1st, 2022 and June 30th of 2023. There uh, was approximately $6.6 .6 million available in total for all three funding sources. And we received proposals from 14 different organizations requesting uh, nearly 8.2 million uh, for capital, uh, transit capital operating and mobility management projects. Um, this body, the TAC, as well as the board, the HST and FTA 5310 projects. And it's a slightly different path for the Older Americans Act funding through the Area Agency on Aging, that will go to their Advisory Committee on Aging and then the board uh, to approve the funds. So as you see here, uh, and uh, there's packets, these are the funds that were recommended by the uh, Independent Review Panel. And I will say that uh, once approved, uh, these projects will be subject to uh, concurrence for eligibility uh, by uh, the Federal Transit Administration. And this is the proposed motion. And I'd be happy to take any questions. We also have Travis Noon on the line as well, uh, who will assist me with that. Thank you, Matthew. And we'll now entertain questions for staff. I believe uh, Brian Weimer had his hand up first. Brian? Yes, thank you. Um, my question is, I noticed that some of the requests versus recommended funding are different. Um, did you reach out to those sponsoring agencies and uh, was there concurrence on the reductions and what do those cover? I mean, can you help understand that a little bit? Matthew? Uh, I, I think Travis, is, is, is who's the administrator of these funds, uh, is, is the better person to answer that question. Yeah. Um, so most of the requests were reduced funding-wise just because of the funding that was available. A lot of it's operating and mobility management funding. Um, that was cut. Um, and so that, you know, in, in a sense, isn't going to necessarily reduce or, you know, affect their ability to operate in general. It'll obviously affect their ability to completely do what they were going to do in the proposal. But um, it was those projects that were cut. The uh, capital projects were funded fully generally uh, to cover the cost of those capital expenses. Um, and in some instances where capital projects were reduced, uh, we did reach out to the uh, respondents to see whether or not they wanted uh, preferred capital over operating expenses and, or vice versa. So we did reach out to some of them to make sure that they were they got their preferred allocations if there was a method of allocating that. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Travis. Did that answer your question, Brian? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Alex Hyde-Wright? Thank you. Um, kind of a similar-ish question on the reductions in funding. Um, I guess my, my question is mainly on the methodology or criteria used to determine 
um, those reductions? So was it just all of the operating projects had their funding reduced proportionally um, to kind of reflect how much was available or did some projects have their um, have more or a higher percentage of their operating funds reduced than others? And if so, what was kind of the criteria that was used to arrive at the final funding um, amounts? Sure. Um, so the criteria we looked at was their prior awards. So looking at prior, uh, the amount they received in the prior year, um, and then basically looking at the increase and whether that increase was reasonable. If it was, you know, some in some instances, there was an increase, a request for an increase of like 100% or 50%, which uh, in, in situations where we don't have money to cover all the asks, um, you know, we reduce that a little bit more to make it sort of that the increase over their prior year funding was more proportionate to uh, what inflation would be like. Thank, thank you, you, Travis. Did I answer your question, Alex? Yeah. Great, thank you. Hillary Simmons. I have a quick procedural question. Um, as a potential recipient of these funds, I know I'll need to um, abstain from voting for myself, but am I able to vote for other folks? Or is it a full slate together? Uh, Jacob? Yeah, thanks for the question, Hillary. So it's a full slate. So when, when the TC votes on the motion, you all will be voting on just the entire slate of the recommended project funding decision. So um, you can't just abstain from, you know, from sort of your organization, you would probably just be abstaining from the vote generally. Okay, no problem, thank you. Thank you for that thoughtfulness. Sure. Thank you. Elizabeth Relford. Thank you. I, this question actually may be more for uh, Jacob or, or Todd. Um, some of these projects also qualify for MMOF funding, um, the ones that obviously didn't get fully funded. Would you guys, how are you, would you look at those applications if they submitted for MMOF to, comp to basically make the projects whole? Um, because a lot of times it needs to be viewed as uh, expansion of services or some other criteria. And I didn't know if uh, for some of these projects that the funding was um, not fully funded, how that would be viewed through Dr. Cog. Todd, can you answer that? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So um, if an applicant applied under this call and was not successful, they would need to reapply under any one of the four current call for projects um, through the main tip call for projects. So again, it would be a total separate application process. Thank you, Todd. Does that answer your question, Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I guess for clarification, Todd, then if they're only asking for the difference to make this project whole, I mean, that's a smaller application, but you would still view it as a separate application. That is correct. But uh, I think as part of um, how that applicant would write that application, um, I think that would be part of that process and consideration that it's to supplement an existing service. Okay, thanks. And Madam Chair. Yes. I just want to note from the chat that Frank Bruno from Via Mobility also noted that he should abstain. Great, thank you, Jacob. Thank you for pointing that out in the chat. Thank you, Frank. Um, Brian. Yes, I'd like to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee approval of the HST and FTA 5310 projects for July 2022 through June 2023 as recommended by the peer review panel, including staff recommended carryover projects. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for that motion. And do we have a second? I see Art Griffith has his hand up. I'll second the motion. Wonderful. Any further discussion? All right, well, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 If anyone is opposed, please signify by saying no. And if you're saying no, please state your name so we can mention that in the record. And I believe we have a few abstentions. Uh, if you're abstaining, um, please voice your name um, or type it in the record. Hillary Simmons. 
Thank you, Hillary. Thank Hillary's abstaining. And Frank Bruno, thank you for mentioning that. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for your abstention. And Madam Chair, uh, Don Sluter uh, from the city of Lakewood will also be abstaining as well. Yes, this is Don Sluter, and I am abstaining as well. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Cam. The motion passes. Great. We will be moving on to agenda item. I believe it is number five. Number five, the unallocated FY 2022 TIP waitlist project funding recommendations. That's attachment C. And Todd Cottrell, senior planner, uh, will be leading us through this agenda item. Thank you, Todd. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so last year, Dr. Cog became aware of additional FY22 funding sources. Um, this included the State Multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Options Fund, uh, better known as MMOF, and additional federal funding sources um, through the new Federal Transportation Bill. Um, so as you can see, that's outlined in attachment one of your packet. A total um, in FY22 funding was available estimated at $87.6 million. Um, so this table breaks down that funding by both funding type and by wait list. So by wait list, both the regional and all of the sub-regional wait lists. Uh, because a great majority of this funding uh, was available as MMOF funding, um, that funding has a unique eligibility and with being that FY22 funding was federalized with obligation and end dates, um, staff provided individual targets by funding type for each of these wait lists. Um, just as a note that this is a different process than what we have done in the done in the past, only because of that uniqueness to the funding makeup. Uh, but I, we believe that this was necessary to be fair and equitable across all of these wait lists. Um, so staff began the wait list process first by dividing the available funding 20% to the regional share and the remaining 80% to the sub-regional share wait lists. And then working with the individual sponsors on each of those ranked lists, um, as outlined in attachment two, until either that funding target for each list was met um, or the last project uh, was reached. Um, so due to the uniqueness of this waiting list as compared to previous processes, um, staff uh, told sponsors that any FY22 funding that was not programmed during this wait list process would simply roll over to the ongoing calls to program the FY 22 to 27 uh, funding, um, you know, if they were not content with any of their scope or their funding breakdown as their project was indicated on that waste list. Um, they could always not accept the wait list funding and of course apply for any one of these upcoming four calls. Um, they were also told that this would be the last process for these existing wait lists. Um, that's according to the adaptive policy. Um, new wait lists would certainly be created um, once we go through the development process for the 24 to 27 tip beginning a little bit later this year. Um, sponsors were also told that they would need to fit this funding uh, from their waitlist process within the funding parameters set for their waitlist, um, even if they happen to need to increase, for example, their match rates um, to make that project fit. Um, so based on all of these discussions with the project sponsors on each list, uh, the recommended list of projects to fund are included in your packet as attachment three. Um, this process recommends that nine projects be funded, totaling uh, $18.3 million. Um, attachment three also contains the proposed funding type that would be used uh, in addition to the total match, the project cost. Um, there's also some additional relevant information on each project to be funded, including the funding years and some higher level elements that would be contained in the project scope. Um, so with that, we present attachment three um, for any questions or comments that you may have. Um, if not, the motion before you would be to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee um, programming the um, unantic unanticipated available FY22 funds to waitlist projects and administratively modify the 22 to 25 tip. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, Brian Weimer, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, so my question for Todd is, 
the dollar amounts that are being rolled into use, if they're not being used with this, those would be on top of the dollar amounts that were identified in your November presentation of available funding for the various calls. Is that correct? I believe so. The, <clears throat> the amounts that we originally presented um, to everybody, which would have been in that late fall time, time frame, presented the maximum amount of funds that were available without considering what projects would be funded out of the FY22 waitlist process. Um, so we have now made additional updates to the funding projections, which removes this $18.3 million um, from the FY22 funds. Would you be able to share the most current projections that you're giving to each subregion after this has gone through the process? Certainly. All right, thank you. Great, thank you, Todd. Any further questions for staff? Seeing no hands. Oh, I see Art, you have your hand up. I was going to make a motion to Great. move forward with the staff recommendation. Thank you, Art. We have a motion on the table. Brian? I second that motion. Thank you, Brian. Any further discussion from the TAC? Sarah, just a question. This is Frank. Uh, again, I'm just wondering if this is yet another one that I should abstain from. It's not, I realize it's not approving specific programmatic, just putting money into an overall pot uh, that's already been identified. Thank you for the question, Frank. Jacob? Sorry, I'd actually defer to Todd on that. Oh, Todd, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't see any specific reason why anyone would need to abstain from, okay. from voting on this package of projects. Thanks, Todd. Great. Always Thank better you, to Todd. ask. Certainly. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. And all in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And anyone abstaining? Thank you, the motion passes. That concludes our action items for the day. And now we will move on to informational briefings. Our next item is item number six, reimagine RTD update that is attachment D in your packet. And Matthew Helfont will introduce this item, Matthew. Reimagine RTD is an effort by RTD to evaluate and forecast the changing transportation needs of our region. RTD wants to understand what is important to customers, uh, stakeholders, and the public as they look to the future and move past the uh, current pandemic. RTD intends to identify strategies that are connected to green spaces. A key component of this project is developing a system opt optimization plan, or SOP. RTD released the draft SOP for public review in early January. This draft plan serves as a route by route guide for service development between late 2022 and 2027. Public comments on the SOP are due by March 9th. The Dr. Cog board will consider providing input at their work session on Wednesday. We have uh, Bill Saroy here from RTD uh, to go into further detail and introduce the topic a little more. Thanks, Matthew. Um, um, and thanks, um, Dr. Cog, for having us come and present to this group. Um, we, you know, many of you on this group have been involved um, and have been kind of following us and involved throughout, provided your feedback along the way. We've kind of reached a, a kind of milestone point and coming up with the draft plan. Um, and as many of you know, um, we, are, we have some challenges in front of us, namely um, related to workforce first and foremost, and then financing. But um, so, you know, many people have expressed some concern about the SOP related to, you know, the, our ability to provide, you know, the service that everybody wants. But um, unfortunately, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do that. And I'm gonna turn it over here to Holly and Julie 
to kind of go over things. But I think what we've done with the SOP is really tried to put forth our best effort from kind of an efficiency standpoint that, that really works on making the system as efficiency as efficient as it can be given the resources that we do have. So with that, let me turn it over to Julie. Perfect, thank you, Bill. Matthew, do you need to share my screen or do you have it? Either way it works. I, you could share your screen or I have it ready to share if, if you want me to. Whatever's better uh, that's for you. Fine. Yeah, if you wanna just pull it up, that would be great. Sure, I will share, just give me a minute. Thank you. Start here in just a second. Terrific. Thank you so much. If you want to go right to that next slide. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit about the overall Reimagine RTD, which is the overall project, as well as where our focus today is going to be on the system optimization plan. A little overview about it, what we're working to accomplish with it, um, and then talk a little bit about public engagement, what we're hearing so far. And then we will end with just a little bit, um, just kind of a stay tuned for the mobility plan for the future. If you go to the next slide, please. So the, for those of you who have been engaged in Reimagine R2D, there are two major components of this study. The system optimization plan, which is what we're focusing on primarily in this presentation, which is really looking big picture at the entire transit network and redesigning it to make sure that it's being it's efficient, it's effective, and it's meeting RTD's uh, budget limitations. And this is something that will be implemented through 2027. And then, as I said, at the end of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about something we'd love to come back to you and have a little bit more conversation, the mobility plan for the future, which is long-term strategies for RTD looking out in the 2050 uh, timeframe. Next slide, please. So what is a system optimization plan? It is really a route by route analysis across the entire RTD district, looking to, to specifically make sure that we set up a network that increases ridership, that improves service performance and efficiency. And the most important piece really lives within RTD's financial and workforce constraints. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. So it started with you know, conducting a, a sort of a baseline document, which is on our website, if you're interested in seeing the comprehensive assessment of existing services. Then reviewing existing travel patterns to see what has changed. We're very excited. We were able to use um, LBS or location-based location -based data services, which were cell phone information that we were able to track that gave us some really uh, new information around what those travel patterns are. Really taking a hard look at RTD's financials, meeting with the community and organizations and groups like yours to make sure that we understand goals and values, and then drafting, obviously, the SOP. Next slide, please. So one of the main, the, the foundation for the system optimization plan are, is a series of guiding principles that were approved by the RTD Board of Directors last year. And so very quickly through these, you'll see them on the bottom, but how the SOP really supports these guiding principles. You know, from a mobility perspective, it's providing that rel reliable, optimized service and really looking at these travel patterns. Again, using some of the new tools like we talked about with the location-based service data to really truly understand where individuals are moving how and how they're moving through the system. Equity, you know, Title VI, the federal requirement was a, a very important overlay as we were looking at opportunities um, for, for making the system more efficient and really looking at those areas of improved need, you know, those areas that during COVID, for example, where people were still really relying on that system and making sure that those uh, that we're providing the best service we can for those communities. Financial, it's all about living within our means, right? It's all making sure that the, this financial plan really does um, work within the conservative and, and you know, realistic assumptions of the, the long-term financial plan for the organization. Partnerships, um, Holly can talk about this a little bit more when we get to the mobility plan for the future, but we are looking at setting sort of a roadmap for partnerships, a, uh, setting a little bit more expectations. How do they work? Who do you reach out to? What sort of partnerships is RTD interested? How do I work with them? So there'll be more information coming on that. Workforce, part of the reason we're having to implement the system optimization plan through 2027 is our workforce challenge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, as transit agencies across the country and other commercial, you know, and private entities across the country, identifying enough workers to operate and maintain the system um, has been a real, a real challenge and continues to be. And then finally, sustainability, you know, really laying out a, a plan to effectively serve our customers and really optimize that service delivery um, to provide, you know, the more service, the more people we can get on the on transit, the better. 
So with that, I'm going to hand it over. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. I've got a couple more. So two challenges. I wanted to lay out the two challenges. And especially looking at this group, I don't think anybody's going to be shocked about either of these. The service area challenge. RTD has one of the largest service areas in the country, over 2,000 square miles across eight counties. And so I'm sure you're familiar with our conundrum, but this has been a real challenge with the SOP is to how do you balance the needs of the core areas of the district with that have density and have um, transit dependent individuals that really rely on the system and where there are a lot of riders versus if you get step out into the suburbs, you know, these are really important areas as well that have been paying into the system for a long time and are interested in, the, in you know, obviously would desire increased service as well. And so what the SOP tries to do is, is balance between those two, trying to provide the service where the riders are, but also recognizing that the system has to work as a whole throughout the entire district. So that's one of our challenges. And then the next slide, this is, this is uh, what we already talked about is our workforce challenge. Um, RTD is working very hard on this issue, looking at bonuses. They're in the process of labor negotiations, talking about salaries. So they really are focusing on this. This is actually driving more, uh, more of the implementation timeframe than financials at this point. And just to kind of give you a sense. So if you look at the full build out of the 2027 SOP, the RTD is looking to need another 250 to 400 um, operators. And, and additional workers to maintain and operate those systems. So that gives you a little bit of a, a sense of the, the level of concern and the level of, um, of impact that the workforce availability issue is having on RTD. So with that, now I'm gonna hand it over to Holly. She's gonna talk a little bit more about the SOP, what we're accomplishing with it, um, and you know, we'll move forward from there. Holly? Great. So as Matthew mentioned, the SOP is really a route by route review of RTD services and makes recommendations for how those can be improved to be more efficient, to provide better service, more reliable service to the people of the district. So there were three real fundamental guiding um, um, principles that we used in that system design as we were looking at that route by route analysis. The first was simplification. So this is making sure that the routes are really well defined, that you understand if you're traveling on this corridor, there's not a lot of route deviation off the corridor so that the rider goes from point A to point B efficiently. Consistency, where we have fewer irregular trip patterns. So, you know, sometimes we have a trip pattern where we have some um, in the AM, a few in the AM and a few in the PM. And this provides more consistency about those trip patterns, where they're going and when they're provided. And then reliability. And, and this really looked at trying to eliminate some of the really long routes where RTD was having a hard time sticking to the schedule. And then the rider is left wondering if the when and if the route is going to show up. So really, and, and a lot of these are interconnected. It's not one of the three. Sometimes it's all three together. But those were the three that we were really trying to focus on to provide better customer focused um, services. The next thing we did is looked at all of the services provided and organized them into four travel market categories. So this is really focused on what trip pattern you're trying to accomplish and how you accomplish it in these categories. Um, so the core is really the basis of the service, regionally focused backbone, and makes up about 41% of the service hours that are put into the system optimization plan. The connect category is those local bus and rail routes that connect the backbone so that you want to get to that backbone service. You want to get to some of the maybe the Southeast or Southwest rail line, you wanna to get to the Route 15, you wanna to get to the 40, these are gonna make those connections for you. Um, commute trips, these are very specific routes that are taking you to um, specific areas like downtown Denver, the airport, some of those really big destinations where we need to make sure that we make those commutes, very specific focused commute connections. And then community makes up about 14% of the service hours in the SOP. And those are designed to meet those local individual community needs. And you know, some that you might not think of, you might think of in a different category, but I use the 16th Street Mall as an example. This is a very community focused route within downtown Denver. Um, it has incredibly frequent service, but it's not a core service. It's a community focused service because it's very isolated to what the 
the travel market is, and that's of course connecting the, the two, um, the two um, endpoints of the downtown area. Um, and then this will step in, you can see the, the red lines represent the rail routes, um, the yellow represent the community services. And you can see these are shorter routes that are focused on localized community areas. And then if you click one more time, we'll be, we should be able to see the commute routes. So you can see the connection often to downtown Denver. You can see some connections over to Denver International Airport. The next one should be the connect routes. And then the next one um, is in blue and shows the, the core backbone network of the, of the service. Okay. So one of the things that people asked, and I think this is a great question to pose, and, and what did we, what were we actually trying to achieve and what did we were we able to achieve with this redesign of the, the system optimization plan. So this gives you a couple of interesting tidbits here. So there was a 57% increase in district-wide access to 15 minute or better service. This is one of the things we heard loud and clear from the technical working group and the advisory committee was a real need to focus on high quality backbone network so that people would actually be interested in using these services. So what the SOP does is increase that um, the access to that 15 minute or better service by quite a lot. Um, it also increases services to communities who rely on transit for their transportation needs, which sometimes we call them social equity populations. There's a 50% increase in access to 15 minute or better service for the social equity populations. And there's a 20% increase in midday service. So one of the things we learned when we looked at the location-based services data, where people are traveling, when people are traveling, who is traveling, what we were trying to do is look at, we specifically looked at social equity populations and where are they traveling? And does our bus service and our rail service provide them the service they need to get to the jobs they're going to? Because in addition to the TWG and HC telling us to provide excellent high quality service on that backbone, they also said, you've got to serve the social equity and essential workers of our region. And so we looked and we said, where, where do people live? Where are they going? And we compared that to the route network and made modifications to better make that service. One of the big takeaways from that was there was a higher proportion of people in that considered the social equity population groups to be, they're making trips in the midday. So what we knew is that rather than just focusing on those commuters that traveled in the morning, didn't travel in the midday, and then they traveled in that afternoon peak, we knew we needed to have more reliable service all throughout the day. Now there's a bit of a hump in the morning and the afternoon, but that dip in the middle of the day is less. We've brought that up and it does a couple of things. It actually addresses issues with the workforce where they did not like having a split shift and it addresses better addresses the transportation needs of the mobility of the social equity um, populations. Um, and then the SOP balances that frequent service in high density areas um, and connecting the service to the suburbs as well. Um, so SOP implementation. So our next step in this process, we have, I think Julie helped me out here, but I think we've received over a thousand comments on the SOP and we really appreciate all the communities getting the word out about that. Lots of great input for us. Um, We've been going through all the comments. Every single comment, will we will review every comment. We will address every comment. We are going to implement everything that we can reasonably while still sticking with those guiding principles that we use, those design principles that we use to put the SOP together, making sure that we're still serving our social equity populations and making sure that we're still focused on that backbone, high quality backbone network. Um, so we'll, the comment period ends uh, March 9th. We'll be reviewing all the comments. We're gonna make adjustments to the SOP and work on getting that finalized. Um, a lot of the comments are talking about, we'd like some more service here or to extend the service or increase frequency. And of course, um, financially RTD and from a workforce perspective, probably won't be able to implement some of those requests immediately, um, but they certainly will be evaluating those and uh, putting them on the table for future considerations. Um, and then of course the implementation of the SOP will be 
phased in over time as resources, both funding and workforce allow between now and 2027. Great, thank you, Holly. Just a couple more slides and then we'll open it up for questions, but did wanna kind of build on where Holly was talking about in terms of public outreach. If you go to the next slide, First of all, I just want to say thank you. Lots of you on this call have been super helpful about helping us get the word out, and we really appreciate that. Uh, originally, we had the comment period ended uh, in February 9th, but we based on you know requests we received from, from you guys and stakeholders, and we needed a little bit more time, so we have extended it to March 9th. Um, during this time period, we've had lots and lots and lots of meetings. We've also been doing um, public, we've got a public meeting tonight at 530. If you go onto rtd-denver.com, you'll see the information in the Zoom link. We also have another public meeting this Wednesday and, oh, sorry, the third, so another public meeting, the third, and that meeting is entirely in Spanish. And we're just trying to make sure that we're providing lots of different um, folks opportunities to provide us feedback. We also, starting several weeks ago, we have collateral on buses and trains, so we really have a customer-focused uh, piece of this, as well as a lot more media outreach. We've been doing social media, digital ads, um, those types of things, as well as individual meetings along these lines. So really appreciate everybody's help uh, getting the word out. And if you go to the next slide, as Holly said, we have well over a thousand comments at this point. So they cover a broad geographic area. This is a snap snapshot of the tool just to show, you know, as you know, you can go on the tool if you're interested in everyone else's comments, you can click on the yellow dots and you could actually see what other folks are commenting as well. Um, but to kind of reiterate what Holly said, our, our real challenge with this is over a thousand comments, 80% of the comments are requests to add enhance, add or enhance services. And so that obviously given the, the financial and workforce limitations we're under, those are going to be a little bit challenging. Um, but to Holly's point, we're gonna be evaluating everyone, every one of the comments, and we will be developing a document where you'll be able to see every single one of those comments and a response. Uh, and that will be uh, eventually posted on the website once we uh, move forward with the RTD Board of Directors. With that, I was hoping Holly could talk just very briefly about the mobility plan for the future. It's just a bit of a teaser for you on kind of our next efforts for this. And then we will be happy to open it up to any questions you may have. Great. So the mobility plan for the future is where we go from thinking right now, how do we get the very most out of the services available in this immediate moment in the next few years? So looking uh, at a farther out time frame, and really our focus is out at the about the 2050 time frame. Um, and what does RTD look like, and how do we make sure that RTD provides the best mobility services to the region when we look out farther, so that we can start to position RTD um, to make adjustments to their organization to really respond to growth in our region that we anticipate emerging um, travel technologies, um, mobility as a service, how should RTD be a mobility integrator and what does that look like for RTD? Um, so this process has been, it's been going along in parallel with the system optimization plan, but of course with the pandemic, the system optimization plan kind of became a focus when the services went to you know, about 50% of what RTD had provided and just a real need to really focus on how we're gonna rebuild and, and get back to a bit more service around the region. So we've been focusing on that SOP, but all the while we've been working on the mobility plan for the future as well. So really looking at what demand do you have in the future? How best to serve it? What is RTD's role in that? There's a lot of great things that are part of that. We're looking at, um, we're looking at parking and what parking policies may need to change or be updated. We're looking at those first and final mile connections, mobility as a service, of course, and you know, can I get on an app handily and get all the information I need to make a trip around the region? Or is it disconnected what's happening between you know, RTD and something at the local agency level and perhaps what's happening at Uber and how do we bring all of that information into one spot? Another big focus has been electrification and is this the right um, move forward for RTD or is it some other kind of a, um, a zero emission fleet? So lots of focus around that and we continue to move forward and um, hope to have in the next couple of months some um, more information for you to provide feedback on those recommendations as well.
Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Got to do it once a meeting. I apologize. <laughs> that is um, that is our presentation, but we'd love the opportunity to open up to questions and comments. Great. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Bill. I see a hand raised by Brian Weimer. Yes, this is a, a question regarding the mobility plan for the future. Um, I guess whatever comes out of the strategic plan, would you have time frames when you would see maybe implementation, um, when specific services might be expanded, provided, that sort of thing? Is that part of your scope to kind of lay out a plan for implementation or further evaluation when various components of the plan would be needed? Yeah, there are there are some recommendations that are um, coming up through that process that are more near term to long term. Because um, looking out in 2050, there's obviously a lot of stuff that is farther out, but there's also some near term recommendations too about um, supporting workforce um, enhancements, for instance. Um, I am not anticipating the, the system optimization plan will make some recommendations on implementation for how you consider how you grow from the route by route services that were recommended there and increase those over time. Um, but it, those would not be included in the mobility plan for the future if you're asking about like a specific route recommendation. Yeah, and I suppose that's part of it. You know, you said that you had what 80% comments on additional services yeah. and yeah. how does that then play into the mobility plan for the future right so you know they the two are working together of course but i would look to the um, system optimum that information will probably live with the system optimization plan and there will be some recommendations made for how rtd uses and perhaps enhances their three times a year evaluation of services to build and grow um, the system optimization plan over time beyond you know what is what is in that initial recommendation and that there are things that you know RTD is always doing like um, looking at uh, new development for instance or a changing travel pattern and they do that now three times a year where they go through the run board process. And I think there's some opportunity there for some enhancements around that, um, but that I, idea would stay in place where you're always continually evaluating what's on the ground and what's happening to um, grow your services over time. Thank you, Holly. Does that uh, answer your question, Brian? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ron Papsdorf. Thank you. Chairwoman Sarah, appreciate it. Um, I guess what one announcement for this group, so you're all aware, the board of directors asked for a conversation at its board work session meeting this Wednesday, March 2nd. Um, that meeting, I think, begins at 4 p.m. You should check our event page for the agenda materials. We are suggesting they, the board is interested in potentially making some official board comments to RTD on the system optimization plan. So uh, for those interested and for those of you uh, that support uh, board members, uh, I would encourage you to sort of review that material, maybe discuss with your board members prior to the board work session meeting Wednesday afternoon. I give a couple of questions. I really appreciate all of you from RTD and, and Holly for being here this afternoon and, and um, providing this information. I have a, I have a couple of questions um, on, Slide nine, I think you speak about the four service categories. Those seem those all seem to be bus service categories and rail is considered separately, um, if I understand the way you presented it um, correctly. So that's one question. And then that relates to the second question, which is, does that analysis that's, just, that's described on slide 10 about the improves the service improvements as a result of the SOP, does that take into account rail or is that only related to the four bus service types um, that are described on slide nine. So those are my first yeah. questions and I have a last one. Okay, so um, the, the four categories on slide nine do actually include rail. So rail, our rail services as they stand are included either in the core or connect routes. 
Um, many of them are core, but you know, I use um, like the R line is a one that's considered a connect route. So you can, okay, thank there, you. there are, but there are routes in both of those categories. And the analysis, um, I want to check on that for you because I want to make sure that I don't answer you correctly. So I apologize. I, I think I know that yeah, I think it's a whole network, but okay. before I give you incorrect information, I do want to double check. That'd be great. And then I guess my last um, comment slash question, I just want to clarify because I think uh, both Holly and Julie made a comment that um, may, may be a little troubling to our local government members. And that is that, and look, understanding that there are uh, a, a set amount of financial resources and human resources available to put service out there on the system. And that sort of a, a put here is a take here. Um, and, and certainly I think everyone understands that. Um, but the, I guess what I'm reacting to is sort of the sense that, hey, here's our recommended SOP and if we get comments requesting additional service here or extending a line here, sorry, we can't accommodate that mm -hmm. um, because we've recommended an SOP within our available financial constraints. And I think um, I would certainly encourage, and one of my comments to RTD would be, there ought to be an evaluation of those comments about whether they're, whether we should shift some resources from yes. a service we're, we're recommending in the, in the SOP against a recommendation that RTD receives from the public, other stakeholders, or local governments in the region. And I don't think you meant to say it that way, but it came across that way. Right. I, I love that as a um, clarification. I would use Arvada as an example. We, we had an opportunity to go meet with um, some community members. I, I can't remember their official title. It's the I think it's a transportation board, similarly for the community. They made some recommendations around some routing and we were very, the decision hasn't been made on this yet, but the routing that they have requested is really uh, funding neutral. So it looks like we're gonna be able to move some stuff around and be able to accommodate their request. So I think that was a, a great example of, you know, some ability to move some move things around and meet their desired outcome in that particular example. Um, and yes, the, um, the services that are recommended or have been suggested by the communities, all of them will be considered. And if there's an opportunity to shift some things around and because this is just a really good idea that the team has not considered, that will absolutely happen. Um, I think what, perhaps you were hearing from Julie and I is that just a sort of the stark reality that clearly everybody can't, we, there's not enough room to add that much in the budget. So it, it is, there is some shuffling that will happen, but it's, there's not enough workforce or dollars to go around to accommodate everything. And, and frankly, it wouldn't even make sense from a whole regional perspective when we're trying to look at the whole network as a whole, because, you know, we're getting isolated comments in, in particular locations. So hopefully. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Holly. And, I, and again, I think we all understand that there are uh, financial limitations and resource limitations for the service. I would encourage RTD to be open-minded to yes. comments. And there are, there are trade-offs and there might yes. be some hard conversations following all of the comments come in where there has been service proposed in this draft SOP but as a result of some comments or rethinking might warrant shifting some resources from one place to another to balance sort of regional interests um, and all of that and understand that those can lead to some challenging conversations. But I, yeah. I, I would hope that the draft SOP as proposed is not basically fixed. No. There is still opportunity to revisit um, and potentially uh, change the SOP based on comments that come in. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is. And, and we are actively working on those right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for the questions and comments. Jacob Rieger. Actually, Madam Chair, I'd like TAC members and alternates to go first. I see Eugene has his hand raised. I can speak after him. All right. Thank you, Eugene. Eugene. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this time. Um, 
Holly and RTD, I have a question and it's a loaded question. So I recognize that. And I also am asking this question in light of understanding and, and realizing the challenges around staffing and funding, et cetera. Um, but the one thing that I'm wondering where in this work that you all have been doing so well is the topic of safety and security. We can have the best, most optimized system in the world, but if no one feels comfortable using it, it's kind of ignoring another major issue. And I say that as a transit dependent user. So can you address where in this process uh, safety and security might exist? Yes, so I can tell you that we did do very early on, we did a whole review of RTD's safety and security protocols, their budget allocation compared to peer systems, and there were some recommendations made in there about um, some best practices. I would say that was really pre pandemic and some of the safety and security issues that we're seeing now are perhaps um, exacerbated or you know even more pronounced than maybe they were even then so probably needs another eye to that and I think that's a really good call Eugene so we'll we'll flag that I, I will tell you that safety and security always when you're you know working with RTD is uh, top priority so they have not lost sight of that and continue to um, make headway but I don't have anything specific for you for this moment for the SOP and let me let me add to that this is Bill um, so Eugene thank you for the comment and and we have gotten several comments related to safety in you know in through the the SOP I think the challenge for us is it's you know it's a bigger broader issue and frankly it's one of those issues that we need partnerships and you know specifically and I'll use the probably the most talked about example which is Union Station and you know the notion of trying to make that a much safer place everybody who's been reading the paper over the last couple of weeks have seen you know the the additional police presence there and everything else but again it's 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 a an issue that goes well beyond RTD that we have to work with others namely the city and you know, city city police force and homeless service providers and others to address because it's not just an RTD issue. And, and again, we hear you about the issue of safety, and we've heard it throughout kind of the SOP process. It is a challenge, and it is an ongoing challenge. And I, I call said, I think we will be addressing it, probably not to the degree that many people would like, but I think there is, and this this so everybody knows, there is an ongoing effort on our part to address. Um, safety and security, because we know it's an ongoing challenge for us and with our customers. And again, you know, it's one of those things where we need need any help that we can get from others. Because it, again, it's not just simply a transit issue; it's a bigger issue, I think, for all of us regionally. I wholeheartedly agree with that, um, and I do think that it is a regional challenge that requires regional solutions from all the partners involved. Um, and, and given that it's the system that is bringing the issues to light. Uh, I just wanted to just understand where and how and what it might take to address those issues so that we do really have a system, a regional system that people not only can find the value in using it for their mobility needs, but also have the public perception, a positive perception of transit in general. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Bill. Eugene, any further questions or comments? None for me, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, Jacob, I do not see any further hands raised, and if you'd like the floor. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Matthew, if you could go back to slide number nine. Um, Holly, a question for you. In this sort of route and network analysis, can you talk about to what extent, if any, FlexRide was part of this work from the perspective of you know, the route and network analysis of particularly being able to provide access for um, geographic areas that aren't well served or won't be well served by kind of fixed route or rail and filling in some of those gaps and providing some level of transit service to be able to, you know, serve those folks and channel those folks to the fixed route and rail network. Was, was FlexRide part of this or will it be part of this or is that a separate consideration somewhere down the line? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for calling that out. I did not, um, I did not flag that earlier and appreciate that. 
So the flex rights that are on the ground today, those remain as part of the system optimization plan. The team is also evaluating, you kind of have to land your, the rest of your network before you can make some modifications around this, but the team is also developing what we call um, the mobility on demand zones. This could be served by a flex rides, a new flex ride, a modification of some existing flex rides or other services um, like um, there's some programs in, that RTD has in place with communities that are taxi voucher programs and that sort of thing. So it could come in other forms as well. And looking to use those mobility on demand zones that include the flex rides to supplement areas that may not make sense to serve by some of these fixed routes or rail lines that we're looking at on the network today. So those are when we've started some of that conversation um, at that service sector level, but there's definitely more conversation to come once we understand better what, you know, that we have the final SOP lines on the ground, we can see where we need to have that complementary mobility on demand service um, and have start to progress those conversations a little bit farther. Thank you, Holly, appreciate it. you any further questions or comments for the project team not seeing any hands oh I, there we go uh george see you, see you have your hand uh yeah i i'm i'm just wondering how the workforce shortages will be taken into account so we we create eventually the the sop right and then we say okay you would need that many you know, operators, maintenance people, te technicians, etc. And then you turn around and, and you see that, you know, you have various scenarios of, of, you know, workforce shortages. So is there any plan about that and, and how, how we tackle that constraint? Well, Bill, this is probably mostly you, but uh, of course the um, negotiations with the union have, I think they're just getting wrapped up and in the news recently, we we saw that RTD operators may be seeing a fairly sizable bump in their salaries, which amongst ourselves as a project team, we were like, okay, great. Hopefully we'll get some operators so we can get some service on the ground, which was exciting. Um, so that's one place where, you know, RTD and the union have been working diligently on that. As far as specific to reimagine, we have been researching every every place we can get our hands on um anybody who's put something in place that has had some success and i'll tell you like a lot of agencies are having the same trouble um but one of them that um george i think den is putting in places uh, that we've talked about is the internship program and starting to um look at how we develop a group of people, you know, as they're coming out of high school and give them the skill set that they need and grow them over time to um, learn how to be mechanics and learn how to be operators and come get their CDL. So that was one um, that we had, I think that actually came from LA Metro where uh, Phil Washington, of course, previously was and now has brought that to um, Den. Um, and there's a several other areas of recommendation for helping to support that improved morale and attraction of workforce. Um, but of course, all those things just take time. It's not, it won't happen in a turn of a dime. Bill, other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I was just going to, just to add, I think that, you know, separate from reimagine, we've had a group of people that have been working on this issue for a while. Um, it's a challenge. And I just saw something today. I mean, this is a this is a this is an industry wide challenge. I think it actually goes well beyond transit. But I just saw today that um, I think Sound Transit is going through a service cut because of worker issues. Several agencies around the country are in a very similar boat. And I think, you know, it's it's a it's a fundamental challenge that we hopefully can all, you know, get our heads together to help overcome. Because I don't think, you know, we're hoping that you know the first piece of the puzzle is is the is the salaries and and the kind of the, the CBA which like Holly said we're crossing our fingers within the next week or so will be finalized and so that will be a you know a three-year agreement with our union um, which will you know the expectation is salaries will be raised significantly 
Um, and there's some workforce rules that hopefully again, you know, help in terms of, you know, being more, more of an attractive workplace for, you know, our, our frontline workers. So that being said, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't say that, you know, a year or two from now that we're all of a sudden going to be over the hump and we're, you know, we'll have 200 or 250 operators, like we said. And so the challenge is we've got to kind of hopefully look at this as a, as a bigger picture problem is again, I, I think it goes beyond transit and thinking about it. I know we've talked about something about, is there, is there kind of some regional focus on this? Because again, trucking industry. I mean, I know you're having some issues at the airport in terms of with workforce shortage. So how do we deal with some of these issues kind of comprehensively? Because I do think it's, it goes beyond transit just, just in terms of an issue. Yeah. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Any further questions or comments for the project team? Todd, Todd Cottrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a question in regards to sort of the t the current tip process that's ongoing right now. So as most of you are aware or should be aware of, uh, there is a current call for projects out and there will be a three additional calls uh, extending all the way out to uh, federal fiscal year 27. And I think we certainly expect um, there will be some proposals put forward and hopefully some projects funded that do contain transit or local governments requesting new transit service or at least putting funding towards existing service. Um, so I think it would be good if there's somebody from the project team that could help explain maybe a little bit um, to those potential sponsors, how those new requests for funding may fit into this plan that you're developing. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'm sure we can, we can offer that opportunity and again, you know, I think the, the one thing that's going to be a little bit, because again, we, won't, we may not have an answer, you know, like in the time frame of some of the TIP process. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping to work with our board to get this adopted relatively soon, probably early summer. Um, but we don't know at this point, we don't have a specific schedule. But again, until that gets final adopted, we won't know exactly it. But I think we can certainly give some feedback to those that are applying for transit related service that, you know, in terms of the, its relationship to the SOP. So Bill, it might be on a case by case basis. Is, yes. I think, you know, as opposed yeah. to like, this is how we handle it because it would right, be right. exactly unique to like federal, for instance, might be different than, you know, something else. I don't know, federal's on the book. So I use that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Bill. I don't see any further hands at this time, um, but I just wanted to make a comment related off of uh, Ron Papsdorf's comments and Jason Rieger about um, the, the process for um, the system optimization plan and how that may be perceived. I do see in your slides that equity is extremely important and I believe that has been made clear in the process from all of us stakeholders. Um, but it does appear from your slides that equity populations are receiving an increase in service in some areas and it does appear perhaps at the expense of equity populations in other parts of the RTD district. So I would encourage you as we work through these next steps, you know, how that, how these populations are being impacted and, and how we can be sure we're providing good transportation service across our district to our vulnerable populations. We appreciate the, um, the comments from everybody and the questions and thank you, Holly. And thank you, Bill. And thank you, Julie. Thank you for having us. Yep, thank you. We appreciate the feedback. Thank you. We will move on to our next informational briefing, which is item seven, community access enterprise overview. This is attachment E in your packet. Jacob Rieger will lead us thank through you. this topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. So based on a previous request from TAC, um, you all asked for sort of a briefing on the four new enterprises that were created as part of Senate Bill 260. So we're starting today with the Community Access Enterprise. Um, and to give us a briefing for that, I'd like to welcome uh, Carrie Atia from the Colorado Energy Office. Carrie, take it away. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to be with you all today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share information about the new Community Access Enterprise. I'm going to pull up a slide deck here.
Okay. Uh, so as Jacob mentioned, my name is Carrie Atia. I'm the uh, Community Access Enterprise Board Administrator and Senior Program Manager. And for those who may not be aware of the Community Access Enterprise, uh, it is one of the new enterprises that was created by the Colorado legislature through Senate Bill 21260, the large statewide transportation infrastructure bill last session. And the community access enterprise is housed within the Colorado Energy Office or CO. The business purpose, according to the legislation for this enterprise, is to support the widespread adoption of electric vehicles, including vehicles that were originally powered exclusively by internal combustion engines, but have been converted into electric vehicles in an equitable manner by funding the construction of charging infra infrastructure throughout the state of Colorado and incentivizing the acquisition and use of electric motor vehicles and electric alternatives to motor vehicles in communities, including but not limited to disproportionately impacted communities and by owners of older, less fuel efficient, and higher polluting vehicles. So I know that's a mouthful, uh, but it does come from the legislation. And so I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you so you have a sense of really um, the, the focus uh, for the community access enterprise. We have a seven person uh, board of directors for the community access enterprise. Reverend Eugene Downing with New Hope Baptist Church is currently serving as the chair of the board. Sarah Myros with Ford Motor Company is serving as the vice chair. We also have Ryan Hurst with Motive Power Systems and Alice Laird with the Clean Energy Economy for the Region or CLEAR as the four board members who were appointed by Governor Polis. There are then three members uh, representing different departments or state agencies on the board, including Rebecca White with the Colorado Department of Transportation, Michael Ogletree with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and Will Tour, who serves as the Executive Director of the Colorado Energy Office. The first board meeting was held in November of 2021. The board meets on the second Thursday of each month from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. All meetings are open to the public and you are all encouraged and welcome to attend any of the board meetings. Uh, I will post into the chat after this presentation the website for the enterprise and that's where you can find updated information about the enterprise, any upcoming meetings, past agendas, and presentations. We are currently undertaking a fee rulemaking process, and I will provide a few more details about that in the next slide. We are also developing a 10-year plan. Uh, this is required by the legislation to be complete and posted no later than June 1st of this year. And we will be holding several stakeholder engagement meetings in March, and I want to make sure um, that you all are aware of these meetings. If you are interested to participate, colleagues in your agencies and organizations or others in your network, as we get feedback on the proposed programming and funding for the Community Access Enterprise. We have a light duty meeting happening next Monday, March 7th, a medium and heavy duty meeting coming up on March 9th, electric alternatives on March 16th, and we will be holding two meetings for disproportionately impacted communities, equity and accessibility stakeholders on March 8th and March 15th. But I do want to stress that we encourage and welcome all members from disproportionately impacted communities, equity and accessibility viewpoints to participate in any and all of these stakeholder meetings to ensure that we're having a really diverse and robust engagement process. We will also be developing an online dashboard and uh, filing annual reports to ensure transparency and accountability for the community access enterprise. So a bit more on the funding, uh, Senate Bill 21260 allows the community access enterprise to implement a new retail delivery fee. This is a fee that will be assessed on the purchase of tangible, prop, uh, tangible purchases. Um, so basically just excluding groceries. Um, and that fee will be assessed on transactions for deliveries that are made to your home or to your business. Uh, the community access retail delivery fee allowed by the legislation is six and nine tenths cent 
per order transaction. We have held two stakeholder meetings, one on February 15th and one on February 22nd. Written testimony was requested by February 24th and is due later this week by March 3rd to allow our board time to review comments prior to the fee public rulemaking hearing that is going to be held next Thursday, March 10th at the March Community Access Enterprise Board meeting. The notices posted and translated in Spanish and all the fee documents are posted on the enterprise website. The anticipated funding for the enterprise is $310 million over 10 years and fee collection will begin at the start of this next state fiscal year on July 1st, 2022 by the Department of Revenue. There are several benefits that the community access enterprise is specifically focused on. One is to equi equitably reduce and mitigate the adverse environmental and health impacts of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions that are produced by vehicles, uh, supporting the adoption of electric vehicles and electric alternatives to motor vehicles. These would be e-bikes, e-scooters, micro mobility solutions at the community level, including rural, urban, and disproportionately impacted communities throughout the state of Colorado, supporting charging infrastructure to reduce range anxiety and ensure that electric vehicles are viable in all communities, and incentivizing and assisting owners of older, less fuel efficient and higher polluting vehicles to replace those with electric vehicles, encourage the use of electric alternatives and public transit. So as we consider the new fee that is getting ready to be implemented and as the development of the 10 year plan that will guide programming and funding recommendations, there are a number of opportunities that the community access enterprise can be looking towards uh, in terms of how these new revenues will be utilized. Uh, as we consider how funds will be distributed, we can implement grant, loan or rebate programs that would support charging infrastructure in public workplace, transportation network company, multifamily and other locations, chargers in communities that are including but not limited to disproportionately impacted communities, charging for medium and heavy duty vehicles, including refrigerated trailers, the infrastructure to support hydrogen fuel cell motor vehicles, networks and plazas that would offer fast charging infrastructure, inexpensive and accessible electric alternatives to motor vehicles such as e-bikes and e-scooters, incentivizing the adoption of electric motor vehicles in communities, including replacement of those high emitting vehicles that were already mentioned, and incentivizing transportation network companies to increase access to overnight charging for their drivers. So I covered a lot of information here pretty quickly. Here is the website for the Community Access Enterprise. I will put it into the chat. Um, again, really appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chair. If there's time for questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, and again, really look forward to you all in terms of participating in our upcoming stakeholder meetings for the 10-year plan development. Thanks so much. Thank you, Carrie, for that informational briefing. Do we have any questions for Carrie from the TAC? Wait a moment for any virtual hands. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. Really appreciate you coming to our meeting today to give, provide us that update. Thank you so much. And now we will move on to the administrative portion of our agenda. I believe we just have one item here and that will be the update on the AMP working group. Carson, do you have an update for us this month? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just very briefly, uh, the AMP Working Group met earlier this month uh, and heard an informational briefing, a series of them from the City and County of Denver regarding their Montbello Connector Microtransit pilot project uh, from RTD about their mobility data interoperability principles and Dr. Cog uh, about how they interact with mobility analytics and big data. Now, those were the three informational briefings from this month. Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank Let's you, Carson. Any questions? I think we have a hand up from Ron. 
Sorry, I was just trying to get in the queue. Not a question for Carson other than Carson, congratulations on your appointment to the new position. Thank you, Ron. Great, thanks, Ron. Congratulations, Carson. Uh, any further questions or comments for Carson? Wonderful. Um, that concludes our meeting here. So please note that the J Sarah? 20, oh, Yes, um, did I miss I a twat here? This sure. is why I had my this is why I had my hand up. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The next <laughs> uh, you're about to announce the next meeting, which I should have let you do, which will be March 28th. Um, no change to that. I wanted uh, in terms of still being a virtual meeting. Um, however, I do want to get on everyone's radar screen that um, Dr. Cog is still um, uh, anticipating opening our offices back up and returning to the office beginning April 1st. Uh, that's not a joke. Um, and um, so in light of that, we at this point are um, anticipating that the April TAC meeting, which would be on April 25th, will occur as an in-person meeting, uh, kind of back to back to the Dr. Cock office, to that main floor conference room, for those of you that remember that two years ago. Um, so just wanted to sort of get that on folks' radar screens to uh, be thinking forward to, um, I think we have, we have um, decided that a hybrid meeting platform for TAC meetings will not uh, be functional for us. Uh, that, that room that's large enough to accommodate TAC does not have the, um, the kind of equipment and infrastructure in place to, um, to make uh, that kind of meeting uh, successful. And our experience with most hybrid meetings has been uh, challenging at best and not a very good experience for either those participating in person and those participating virtually. So just wanted to get that out there for people to uh, plan around and, and think about if things change. Obviously, we will make sure that uh, we um, update you at the at the March meeting and keep everyone informed about any changes and plans. But at this point, that's that's our intent. Thank you, Ron. Jacob. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going back to membership updates, I just also wanted to recognize Amber Blake, who is CDOT's uh, Director of the Division of Transit and Rail. Um, she is a TAC member. She's here today, so I wanted to recognize her as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Welcome, Amber. Wonderful. And so our next meeting will be uh, March 28th, and we'll see you all then. The meeting is now adjourned at 2.52. Thank you, Thank Sarah. You. Thank you all.